Welcome to Making a Meal of It, the podcast for eaters of all appetites who want to reimagine and reinvigorate their relationships with food, food culture, and food systems. I am your sommelier and mixologist, David Santo, and today we're getting a little boozy. Not too much, mind you, but just enough to be inspired to think a little differently about the benefits and the effects and, of course, the privileges associated with consuming alcohol. That's because, as we know, liquor cuts both ways, enabling some bodies and minds to beautifully blend, but also creating some pretty problematic results for others. To shake things up a little, literally, listen to this. was the sound of balances being struck, of mind-body convergences, and of gratitude. It was, of course, a cocktail shaker, followed by the universal mantra, OM. OM is about unity, three sounds coming together, AOM, plus silence, of course, to form one inseparable whole. It is the sound of creation, of ourselves, of the universe. And when you're in a room full of yogis whose ohms come into resonance with each other, it just fills you with this wonderful sense of completeness. The other sound, a cocktail being made in a cocktail shaker, is also about equilibrium and harmony, but in a different way. A classic cocktail is a mixture of alcohol, bitters, sweetness, and a dilutant, water generally. Together, they form a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts, that offers a new set of tastes and textures and smells. Of course, there are many types of alcoholic drinks, and these days, innovation is perhaps one of the most central flavors, as it were, that mixologists focus on. Whatever your preference, however, a good cocktail needs balance. In a more moralistic sense, the balance of moderation is also part of drinking. A small amount of alcohol seems to have beneficial effects for many people, though not for all of us, clearly. It can reduce stress, open us up to social and creative exchange, help provide new perspectives on familiar themes. Too much alcohol, however, has very negative effects, and an enormous amount of suffering comes about from the excess and addiction of overconsumption. So where is that sweet spot? Where is the equilibrium in drinking booze? Realistically, it's probably up to each of us to figure it out, both with help from friends and family and thoughtful recommendations, and through careful, very, very careful, attention to and reflection on our own tolerances and drinking habits. What is clear, however, is that one-size-fits-all limits don't really work. Government guidelines, doctors' regulations, and sweeping standards don't make sense when our bodies are so different and our cultural practices vary incredibly widely. So looking inward and outward for the right balance is probably the best way forward. You know, don't take it from me, though. I'm just a food podcaster. In my own life, I know that a cocktail or a glass of wine helps me focus my connection-making ability on a specific task. I think and I feel more creatively and less analytically, more openly, too. So drink also helps me ignore my self-doubts and anxieties about how I'm seen by others. When I was first learning Italian, for example, I discovered that my speaking skills improved enormously when I drank, largely because I just let go of my fear of sounding stupid. The words flowed when I didn't overthink it too much. I've also had times in my life when I drank way too much, not realizing the effects it was having on me or on others. Today, Maxim and I have a single cocktail at the end of most days, about an hour before we have supper. It helps demarcate the transition from work time to leisure time. It lets us relax and talk easily about the day. And of course, it also tastes wonderful with a plate of raw veg and hummus and rice crackers and charcuterie. It's now in our lives very ritualized and it brings a lot of pleasure. And if, as sometimes happens, we also have wine with dinner, or it's a night out with friends and we drink more, my body is not happy the morning after. I'm slowly learning to figure out that balance as well.
To help us with this thinking differently about alcohol consumption, I'm talking today with two people who know a lot about balance. One is a cocktail products entrepreneur, the other is a yoga instructor and food educator. Later on, Maxime and I slowly sip a very textural drink during Stick This In Your Mouth, and closing the episode, a research scientist in radiobiology responds to the food questionnaire. I also share a theory about how drinking doesn't necessarily reduce inhibitions as much as it reduces our field of perception. Kicking things off is my conversation with Jean-Sébastien Michel, a former social scientist turned liquids entrepreneur. Jean-Seb runs Jesemai and Alambica, the first a wholesaler of ingredients and barware and glassware, and the second a retail shop serving restaurateurs and the general public. He's a self-trained bartender and consults to many in the industry, including Educalcol, the Québécois organization focused on education and responsible behaviors related to alcohol. Note that during our conversation at his offices in Montreal, we refer to the SAQ a few times, and that means the Société des Alcools du Québec, which is our provincially controlled alcohol retailer. Jean-Sébastien, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for participating in the podcast and letting us explore the fabulous world of cocktails together. Well, my pleasure. Thank you to have me. So tell me first about uh, Jesemai Enterprises and Alambica, this, this remarkable palace, set of palaces dedicated to cocktails and, and cocktail culture. Um, how long have you been around and, and how did the business come into being? Usually I start to answer this question by once upon a time. <laughs> uh, the whole adventure started in 2011 and uh, the two entities basically grew together. One is about distribution and uh, Alambica is to supply people at home as well as restaurants. We realized it made sense to split those two entities, although they are operated by basically the same people, but di with different logics. Mm -hmm. So it's your own sort of mini dominion or corporation. Even when I was alone, I had two phone numbers, two emails, two companies, two bank accounts. Just because uh, when you sell to your competitor, it's just weird to do <laughs> it with, you know, the name is in competition with them. I'd rather do it with a neutral name. Right. And, uh, and so far it worked. So how it came to, to be, long story short, I've always been a big uh, aficionado of liquids in general. I love tea, I love coffee, I love pretty much everything with alcohol in it or with no alcohol. And uh, I had an academic path. I was not a bartender. Uh, actually, it was kind of late before going to bars. I drank many more shooters <laughs> in my 30s and 40s as a business owner than in my 20s. I was drinking, but I was a bit of a loner. It's a little <laughs> loner, but actually, funny enough, I was a host. I love to host evenings. Uh -huh. For some reason, I was intimidated by the bar scene when I was younger. But when you grow to meet the people behind the scene... They are this is the most welcoming group I could find and hope for. Mm -hmm. And I always felt that uh, I've been adopted by the, the cocktail scene in Montreal. And uh, I've always been really grateful for that because I couldn't grow such a company without a healthy cocktail scene entrepreneur making the cocktails. And at the same time, I realized that for them to have to go to New York or Boston to get the basics was a freaking nightmare and was hindering them a lot in their, in their growth. So to have a one-stop shop that speaks the same language as them and so the first year was more, okay, let's look what, what seems the most viable, interesting. And I will always remember it was a gentleman named Jonathan Omi. He's the prep guy for uh, the Four Seasons in Montreal. He just opened a bar called the B1 at the time. And they were just opening and they were kids. And basically it was, oh, okay, we're a bunch of young bartenders who need stuff and we really don't know where to go mm -hmm. and for me it really struck me that i can work with these people and they are much closer to me to my taste to my generation you effectively found your community in these yes. like-minded people who also enjoyed hosting and being hospitable correct and the crystal ball for alcohol is often to check what happens in the u.s canada is always a bit behind the u.s for these trends and quebec often a bit late on Canada. I was wondering about that because the cocktail culture here in Quebec and in Montreal has sort of exploded about maybe 10 years ago, but that's very late in the history of yeah. cocktail culture. Certainly in the United States, it's been going on forever. Why do you 
think it is, culturally speaking anyway, that we're a little bit slower here in Quebec to dive into the cocktail shaker. I will say something quite generalistic, and maybe I'm wrong. In Quebec, maybe because of the language gap, we're not the first places where things pick up, but oh boy, do we go mad at it when we decide we do it. And distilleries is pretty much that's what that's happening. Well, the, the, the number of gins in Quebec, and yeah. talk about an explosion, were there over 200 gins being produced in Quebec right now? Well, and of course, a number of them are starting to realize that the market's a bit saturated and it's difficult to stay in business if you're producing gin while you've got 200 other competitors. I was talking about crystal ball to see, you mm-hmm. know, the U.S. and for spirits, you don't have to go that far. Uh, beer. There was a huge rise of microbreweries and so on and so forth. And then they started to basically eat each other or a few were able to, to function. Distilleries, it might be even faster and sadder mm. because there are much less outlets. And let's not forget that distilleries won the right to sell their spirits at the distilleries not that long ago. Yeah. But the thing is, sure, now they can sell the spirit at the distillery, but they have to still send a 54% markup to the SAQ. They have to pay for the staff. They have to pay credit card margin for the bag, for everything. So at the end of the day, to sell directly is a no-go. Yeah. They are not allowed to have a bar. So distilleries have that challenge that they cannot sell uh, on the spot. They cannot have a bar where they can transform their own creation to mm-hmm. make added value. At that point, we're pretty certain it's more of a moralistic argument than anything economical or legal. Or Well, and part of the weird history of alcohol in Quebec is that whereas other provinces in Canada formally declared and then repealed prohibition, that never happened in Quebec. So there was a sort of period of semi-prohibition in the 1920s, and then it didn't formally get undone in the same way that totally gin was uh, the the craze at the beginning it piled up some companies that are more let's say marketing companies that make spirits Mm -hmm. than spirit company doing marketing (laughs) so they created compound gin where they add flavors that are really targeted and well made often but but they're more designed to to speak to market research than they are necessarily to correct speak to exactly consumers so are. the real talented people either are about to exile themselves mm-hmm. the really good distilleries who have talent and take time and design they have their back being broken and these guys and women who would release the most interesting whiskies and creation in five ten years they won't be around anymore Mm -hmm. so actually in some places what they do now they're like okay maybe the only way to survive is to put in barrels what we've done close everything and reopen shop in 10 years hoping there's still an industry so if i mean if you were to gaze into your crystal ball um the hopeful one the pink tinted one that makes us feel happy about the future of spirits in quebec do you see some new success story coming along I am especially fond of a project that some people are skeptic about it. But for me, it's a beacon of hope. And it's Aceram. Aceram is basically maple syrup that has been turned into maple wine, then distilled. And at the end, you have some sort of maple grappa. It doesn't taste really like maple. It has no sweetness at all. It's more on a floral note that will almost be a reminder of sake sometimes. Mm -hmm. It still is up to grab what will be the final or one of the final definitions of Aceram. There are multiple distilleries behind it. They decided to, instead of fighting, to share it. And it will be especially interesting when they will figure out what's the best type of pot still to use, Mm -hmm. best type of aging, barrels. But it has, it's the first time to me that Quebec could have its own identity product. And when I say identity, it's not out of nationalism or anything. It's because that's what works now. But something that's meaningful, maple is from here. Totally. Apples, tomatoes. So... What could be interesting for foreign market are really unique to our terroir, to our products, to our knowledge. And Aceram, and eventually maybe some aged product based with apple, uh, small fruits, uh, will gain that notoriety. 
but Maple desire from people from abroad is already there. So to capitalize on this, if I was the government, instead of hindering all the time, I would put some money behind the project of Aceram, make sure that all the embassies pour a bit of Aceram at the end of the dinner instead of cognac, that it's in all the airports of mm -hmm. uh, Canada. It's a, a product that has a lot of potential that could really develop into being our equivalent of Cavadas, Cognac, Grappa, name it. Well, let me shift the conversation to a whole other subject, and that's more about the, the, the nature and the place of alcohol in our consumption life these days. And we've just been recently bombarded with a lot of information, maybe or maybe not that accurate, about how much alcohol we should be drinking as individuals. This is a lot of messaging from the government, from medical organizations, from nutritionists, from the voices in our heads saying that alcohol is bad. What's it like to be in this business, which celebrates alcohol and says, yes, this is good. This is a good thing to consume. I'll circle back to, I think, my first answer. I'm a, a fan of liquids. I love what's good, what's beautiful. And honestly, age helps me to be more mild in my view of the world, I guess. And not only I'm embracing the non-alcoholic aspects, but I'm pushing for it. For me, what's important is not alcohol, it's the people. And bartenders, I want them to become the master of mixing liquids. Where I have problem is the hardcore sobriety discourse. I, of course, nothing against sobriety, but from my perspective, in terms of larger social changes, I would like the bars to embrace the non-alcoholic trend and offer intelligently multiple options mm -hmm. and not wait or be taken aback by this social change and become the conservatives. And there's space for all of us at the table, whatever we're eating. There's drinking. full space. <laughs> and the thing is, it's not black and white. I'm a huge consumer of both. Mm. So when I go out, the thing is, I'm a fast drinker. I drink a lot. In an evening where someone will drink, I don't know, five, six drinks, I'll drink 10. So if I have the tool of non-alcoholics, oh my God, this is so useful. I can switch one other. And at the end of the evening, I'm fine. The next day, I'm fine. I'm in this industry. I have to go out quite often. I, I host. I don't want to be wasted all the time. Right. There's no added value to that. We help a lot of bars right now to develop their non-alcoholic menus. We develop actually like non-alcoholic triple sec, a lot of non-alcoholic liquors through uh, Pro Siro, a partner brand. And we represent an increasing number of non-alcoholic products like Great Amaris, uh, non-alcoholic rum, non-alcoholic whiskeys, gin. We, one of my colleagues here makes a mix. It's called the Sublime. So it's nuts, cane sugar, spices, fruits, and you simply add rum to it to make orange rum. Mm. And we tried with non-alcoholic rum mm. and it's pretty good. Mm. And the, the funny thing is that it's illegal in Quebec. So many sentences start like this. But yeah. <laughs> it's illegal in Quebec to do maceration in a bar for more than 24 hours. And this was hardly fought for a long time. Sangria was illegal in Quebec in a bar because you couldn't macerate at all. So we won the, the battle for 24 hours. So sure, you can have a 24-hour sangria, but à rhum arrangé, no way that it's good after 24 hours. But it's fine for non-alcoholic rum. So you pour the non-alcoholic rum in it, you leave it in the, the refrigerator for a month or so, and it's super flavorful. So you will see on your menus more and more in the non-alcoholic section, non-alcoholic arranged rum. So, so yeah, we, we develop, we help the customers, the bars to, to create basically a whole base, all the ingredients in non-alcoholic. And then they simply have to add either spirit or non-alcoholic spirit to offer the same menu in both so variations. You're, so you're basically making it easy yeah. or easier yeah. for bars to make it possible for people to enjoy almost yeah. the same flavor, if not the intoxication. On that subject of, of finding the balance of creating the cocktail, whether it's alcoholic or not, for you and your personal taste... What appeals to you in, in a cocktail, in the balance that you can create with all of these small, we're sitting here surrounded by hundreds of different <laughs> bottles. When you want to make something for yourself, what do you pick up? I do like to have the choice. I tend to go for simplicity. I'm a huge fan of straight spirits. 
you want to make me uh, extremely happy, bring me a really good Armagnac. For cocktails, I, I guess I'm part of the classic school where I'll have basic spirit, lightly modified. I like to play with the traditional structures. Let's say I will take an old-fashioned structure, so about two ounces of spirit, a fair amount of bitter and a bit of sweetening agent, but I will use instead, let's say, rum instead of whiskey, mm. saffron, syrup, and apricot bitter. And I have like a tagine and, and I'll play like that. So I basically see cocktails in terms of constructs and opportunities. I never use simple syrup because I always feel that using a flavorless syrup. Why is, bother? Well, yeah. <laughs> you can bring in something else. Well, exactly. It's a lost chance of bringing yeah. complexity. Yeah. I guess some people would use the same argument for vodka, but... I don't know. I don't mind vodka per se. Uh, and in some regards, it kind of dilutes, but it opens also other flavors. So I love bitter cocktails and boozy cocktails, but I, I love to make any type of cocktail for others. Mm -hmm. I like the challenge of basically understanding what people will like. And from this, just MacGyver something. And although I don't have a, an official training as a bartender, I think I'm pretty good at juggling with flavors. Yeah. Well, so. if you're a person who likes giving pleasure to others and hosting and thinking through complexity and tastes and combinations and innovating, then I would say you're a bartender. <laughs> well, I would say I'm a bartender too, but yeah, but that's, well, yeah, that's my perspective. It's a bit like photography, you know, even yeah. if you if you have the eye and are able to compose a photo that's, that's balanced and everything, even if you don't have a classical training or a great uh, camera, you can do like really decent stuff. Yeah. So it's a bit the same for me. Well, let's hope this inspires all of our listeners to go out, mix something up, alcoholic or not, and yeah. uh, serve it to a friend and just enjoy the experience of creation. Thanks very much for talking to us. Well, you're so welcome. Thank you. It was great. Now let's drink something else. Okay. <laughs> And if you're now inspired to whip up a tagine-flavored old-fashioned or a non-alcoholic orange rum punch, take a look at Jean-Seb's online shop at alambica.ca. That's A-L-A-M-B-I-K-A dot C-A. I've also shared a few of my own favorite cocktail recipes in the show notes. Next up... Alessandra Castelli, a food educator, wine lover, and mind-body expert. Ale is a former student of mine, and we met at the University of Gastronomic Sciences in Italy when she was doing her master's degree. We then worked together there for many years, and over time discovered we felt very similarly, not only about gastronomic education and Italian food culture, but also about yoga. Although she is far more proficient than I am when it comes to mind-body connection making, I did get to wow her and her Italian friends one weekend when it turns out I was the only one in the group who knew how to make and form pasta by hand. Well, Ale, I'm so glad to see you, to be talking to you, be talking about one of our favorite subjects, wine. Um, and it's really a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you. I'm very happy to. Thank you. We have known each other for how many years? I don't even want to think. But we... I know in many of our meetings, we've had some really nice wine together. Um, what are you drinking now? And what's what's interesting to you about it? I'm really into like natural wines at the moment, like mm -hmm. no sulfides, maybe sometimes not filtered, a little funky, not too much. I started with too funky ones, <laughs> now I switched to less funky. Uh, but I'm yes, I'm I'm really into those kinds of wine at the moment. I find I found them very interesting and and lively. Yeah, yeah. Are, are they are they Piemontese wines or are they wines from other places? Well, of course, you know, in Piemonte, you 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 cannot not drink like wines from here. But at one point, you get annoyed a bit. Or, <laughs> you might get annoyed to drink Barolo, Barbaresco. It can happen. It gets boring after a while. I know. I've done it so many times. <laughs> it can happen. So, uh, I try sometimes to drink wines uh, from other regions, maybe also outside of Italy. It's a way for me to get to know like new places. Is new yeah, for sure. Areas and well, is but are are there many natural wines being produced in Piemonte, or is it is are the are the natural wines more from outside? 
Uh, they're starting now to be a few of them here, more than a few actually, especially yeah, like new generations of producers mm-hmm. there directing towards that sort of direction. You know, in a region like this one where there's a strong culture in terms of wine production, it's not yeah. easy to change way of doing things you know uh you might also be seen not very well you know by like the historical wine producers but i find like new generation to be very brave and that's really interesting and they're making good things my opinion Oh, good. Well, there, I was wondering, because Piemonte, I mean, as you say, Barbaresco Barolo are such incredibly traditional wines, so good, but also there's not a lot of space for innovation or playing around. And certainly if you're talking about funky, that's not what most Barbaresco producers are looking for. In no, their wines. exactly. Also because you have to follow so many regulations to be, yeah. to be called such as a Barolo or Barbaresco, otherwise you cannot be called that. But still, I mean, I think that, you know, new generations are good enough to be able to use the you know the wisdom uh, of that world and mix it with a new approach and mm-hmm. something fresh so i find it really interesting good well next time i'm there we'll have to hunt down some some piemontese uh, natural wines but i don't think i've ever even asked you this where your interest in wine comes from i mean the fact that we have a vineyard it definitely helped we mm-hmm. as a family your family yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in the timorasso area uh, that helped first of all i like wine i like drinking wine so yeah. the- that's one starting point. And then uh, it's interesting to me because it tells you a story about a territory and who lives on it and the, the person who actually produces the wine, okay? Especially if we're talking about natural wines that are lively and, and that change every year and every... And they're following uh, nature a bit more instead exactly. of controlling the wine in a sort of scientific way. They're, they're letting the wine express itself. So it's also an expression of what happened that year if it was a, it was a terrible climate year or you know which is now every year then then the wine is in some way representing that is that is that sort of fair to say yeah exactly that, that's yeah. exactly it yeah and so you've but you've lived in many regions of Italy is there a particular wine region that you prefer or is that too political question to ask <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't think I might have a few favorite ones. Um, I like, well, Piemonte, you, I mean, of course I like Piemonte. It's, it's my home. There are really interesting Sicilian wines now. Mm-hmm. And I like them because, you know, Sicily is an island, so they get all the best of being, you know, cultivated, of grapes being cultivated, where there's a seaside, the sea breeze, uh, where you have volcanoes. Uh, It's a very interesting combination of elements that uh, make wines very special. Uh, Well, Tuscany, of course, but Tuscany is another region such as uh, Piedmont, where there's a strong tradition in terms Mm -hmm. of wine production. So it's hard to find like new, interesting wines, but of course there are. But yeah, I think that maybe Sicily is at the moment really interesting to me. It's going to be interesting also as, as of course, climate changes and it has different effects on the terroir of a given region, how those regions may or may not adapt. Sicily might be very well positioned for longer term wine production. Well, who knows? Weird weird weather is the only predictable thing. But anyway. Well, yeah, in terms of wine production, uh, it is giving, it's a real challenge now for all the wine producers. They don't know. Yeah. They're, they're learning a new way how to take care of the vineyards because the, the, the climate is changing so fast uh, that they, I mean, there are times of the year where, where they knew they they had to do specific things in the vineyard and now it's not like that anymore. Right. So they're learning how to actually manage the vineyard in a new way. Yeah. Well, so even traditional producers are having to be innovative because they just have to maintain, like when the temperature goes up to 42 degrees in the summer, you can't actually uh, just go about business as usual. Totally, totally. And that's, to some extent, is a good thing because the fact that, I mean, they have, if they communicate to each other, I mean, Mm -hmm. they have the same problem, you know? Yeah. 
and that helps in terms of connection because if, if they talk to each other, they find new ways how to adapt and how to solve problems, you know. So it forces somehow also like the old generations, especially in Piedmont, that are kind of not very keen, you know, and like being open and talkative, but it helps. So if they need to find solutions, they go and look for them. Oh, well, that's it. So that's interesting. So sort of perversely, climate change is helping to build stronger connections among generations, but also open people up to a little bit more, I don't know, experimentation or openness or thinking about doing things differently. That's, <laughs> well, there are not a lot of benefits of climate change, but that sounds like a pretty good one. Exactly. Yeah. On a, well, listeners might find this a bit of a weird segue, but um, but bear with us, listeners, because we're going to get there. Uh, one of our other connections is yoga. And you're a yoga instructor and uh, you've given classes and other fitness and well-being courses in vineyards and on the hillsides in Piemonte where you live. And I immediately understood the connection between wine and yoga because it's in my body as well. But what what is what is the connection between wine and yoga for you? Well, I think it's, you know, wine, as I said uh, earlier, it's a lively thing and it changes a lot. And we as bodies, as body and minds, you know, mm-hmm. keep on changing. So uh, every moment, so does, I mean, the same thing happens to the wine. So that's the first connection. There's a, So there's a sort of a movement in both elements, you know, that is us and wine. The fact of connecting the two things, it helps in my my opinion to connect people more to a territory to a terroir and to the people who as i said earlier again to the people who actually produces it so if you have a yoga session in a winery uh, maybe facing their their vineyards and then you taste their wine i think it helps you to have a better connection to the place where you're staying and you know yoga is all about connecting to oneself and to the world around you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that wine is a good way and a good instrument. Uh, I'm not sure I'm using the right word, but I... I no, no, that's, yeah. It's, you, I mean, you know what I mean, to get there. Plus, you know, after a yoga practice, you're usually more open, more keen in absorbing what's around you and what you're tasting, if we talk about wine. Plus, there's alcohol in it, of course, as we yeah. all know. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, it, it, I mean, of course, if, if you drink, like, not a whole bottle by yourself, but if you have a glass of wine, a nice glass of wine, after a yoga class maybe eating something it's a way it, it helps somehow you know to to connect more to what what's around you and um, maybe also to, to the people around you and i was just i was just thinking as you know when i when, when i leave a yoga class or after i finish a practice kind of the first set of feelings i have is intense gratitude I'm just so grateful to have just had that experience. I mean, it sounds cliche, but it is always the effect in my body and in my mind and my emotions. And that to feel gratitude just before drinking a glass of wine would actually be probably a really good thing for me instead of it being ordinary or mundane. Oh, this is exceptional. I am so lucky. This is a moment that I should really be present to. And so, yeah, no, it, it makes even more sense to me now. I don't think I've ever drunk wine after yoga. I made the mistake once of having a, a beer before yoga, which I will never do again because drunk yoga is not pleasant. No, no. <laughs> and I was, I was way too, I was, I was, something was wrong and it just, nope, nope, nope. Um, but uh, but wine after yoga, I think I might might need to be incorporated into my practice. <laughs> and as you say, this this idea that it's it's connecting to other people, it's a way to feel with the environment. I mean, outside yoga is is fabulous. It's often a little more unstable because the ground isn't a flat yoga studio floor. Mm-hmm. But so there's a real sense of what the world is when you're facing it in a downward dog position or touching it in cobra or or feeling the soil exactly. as much as your smell and then smelling and seeing and all seeing. those other senses yeah yeah wow have you had any revelatory moments in a vineyard just after uh, after a yoga practice uh, well, I, as, uh, I mean, I agree with the gratitude thing. I, I really enjoy, I mean, I really feel part of the place where I am. 
I'm I'm getting more and more connected to nature. Um, I think I can't live without it anymore. You know, I, I couldn't go back and live in a big city anymore. Mm-hmm. I really to be close to nature. And I think this comes also from those kinds of experience in like practicing yoga in the vineyard because it really connects you to the land, to nature and and we are part of it, you know, we are definitely part of it. That's what I feel. And I feel it sometimes in stronger, sometimes less, but that's the that's the very good and pleasant feeling. Sometimes really, really strong. Um, and yeah. Yeah, good. So yoga, wine, what else are you working on these days? I mean, I'm developing and running this new project called Casa B, uh, where B stands for Battaglino. That is uh, the name of a a restaurant uh, in Bra that is 104 years old. Wow. And me and Alessia, who's the owner of the restaurant, who's the fourth generation of the same family running it. Incredible. We decided to start this new project, which is basically a room with a big kitchen uh, that we use for workshop and uh, private events. And the idea was to create a space where to share knowledge about well-being, where well-being pass through and comes from sharing nice moments with people, so relationship, sharing food, sharing knowledge about food, and also yoga and meditation practices. That's what we do here. We do also dinners and events. So th- this is the new project I'm working on. Very cool. Casa B. So it's where everything comes together. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's it. Good. Well, I'll definitely include some some links in the show notes for this episode so that uh, our listeners can learn more about how wellness, wine, food, being together, meditation, and all good things can happen in one space. Thank you so much for talking with me and for mm, just reminding me how important it is to to feel good and do well for yourself so that you can do well for others. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And check out the show notes for details about Casa B, the multi-purpose learning and conviviality space that Ale developed and now runs in Bra, Italy, where wine and food, taste and sensing, and minds and bodies all come together to discover great new ways to be in harmony with each other. Do you like booze, Maxime? I do like booze. Yeah? Do you like booze all the time, every day, every way? No. No. (laughs) (laughs) I like booze with a cocktail. Yes. And this is our special edition of Stick This In Your Mouth With Cocktails. Ah. So what I'm actually, we're actually doing this time is not just uh, booze, but texture. Because a lot of bartenders talk about the texture of a drink. So different drinks are stirred or shaken. It produces a different texture in the mouth. But it's a pretty subtle effect. Mm -hmm. And yet texture, like smell and Taste is all part of the flavor experience that we have when, our, when it, things are in our mouth. In corporate talk, we talk about mouth feel. Oh, yes. How does your mouth feel? Well, my mouth is a feeling happy to be tasting those cocktails. Yes. Well, and so what I'm doing particularly this time is uh, thanks to my dear friend Lily Cleary, who introduced me to the concept of a rice-washed cocktail. I'm going to make a rice-washed Vesper and a rice-washed uh, Negroni. Um, so could you please explain what is a rice wash? Because I don't know what that is. Yeah. Well, I, I'd never heard of it either. And and so when Lily told me about it, she said, yeah, it tends to, I looked it up also. And it, apparently the starch on the rice comes off when you're shaking the cocktail mm-hmm. or stirring the cocktail. And it produces a kind of smooth texture in the mouth. So we'll see. I've never done this before. This is brand new for me too. And some people say, oh, it smooths out the the burniness of the alcohol. Oh. Never a problem for me, but anyway, <laughs> I like a little burn. Um, so we've got a Vesper, which is your favorite all time cocktail. Yes. And Negroni, which is not your favorite cocktail because you're not so big a fan of bitter. I'm right? not a big fan of bitter cocktails. But. Yes. But. I'm getting used to them yes, more and more. Because I like bitter cocktails. Yes. And so I gradually introduce a little bit of bitterness into our drinks. Yes. 
Just, you know, because the relationship needs to have some sweetness and some sourness and some bitterness. Mm -hmm. That's a good balance. And it's all about balance with cocktails, yes. too. Yes. So I think this is going to be interesting because it's about the balance of texture, not the balance of taste. Mm. We shall see. I'm interested um, by this concept and I'm curious to taste. Well, they're both gin drinks, too, so that should be interesting. So I'm going to start with the Vesper because I think the Negroni might sort of burn our palates a bit too much. Mm -hmm. All right. We're little drinks, so we're not we're not getting loaded tonight, sorry. Mm. <laughs> All right, so that's pretty well shaken. Mm -hmm. Let us see what it gives. Ooh, it's it's actually a bit cloudy. Yes. Unsurprisingly, I guess. So you Put raw rice. Yeah, just with un uncooked rice, japonica rice. So this is sushi rice that I'm using. Actually, no, it's risotto rice, but it's short grained rice. And hmm. sorry, no twist. We're going. We're going simple this day. Cheers. Cheers. Hmm. I understand the concept. Yeah. I don't know that it brings anything particularly special to uh, Vesper. What's your, th what are your thoughts? No, in fact, I like it less because the Vesper is such a clean, crisp, crisp drink. And to me, this now just tastes kind of like a muddy Vesper. So it's maybe why we recommend them with Negronis and not with all drinks mm -hmm. because it's not something for everybody. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of cloudy and murky. It's not pretty. Maybe I've added too much rice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Listener, don't try it with a Vesper. <laughs> Or do try it with a Vesper and just don't expect it to be a crisp, clean Vesper. Yeah. Okay. Why do you love Vespers so much? Wow. Uh, good question. Because I discovered it on a fabulous trip. Um, and I've a, I was in Firenze, of all places. In Florence, in Italy? Yes. Yeah. In Italy with a good friend. And we were had a wonderful day. And I tasted this. And I don't know why I... I I think the reason why I love it so much, other than the taste itself, is that it brings me back every time to this place. Well, and it's such an elegant drink. So for those, those of you out there who don't drink Vespers, it's three parts gin, one part vodka, and one part white lily with a twist of lemon. And it is just about a perfect drink, even though it's so simple. It just, it, the balance is brilliant. Yeah, it's It's a really wonderful drink. And if you have one on a rooftop terrace overlooking Florence, Italy, mm, then there's a nice memory to go yes. back to. All right. Well, let us try another Italian-related cocktail, uh, the Negroni. When I first discovered Negroni, I was like, what? This is a drink? This is so good. It's very bitter. It's got a lot of flavor. I remember drinking an enormous Negroni at a picnic table at an outdoor festival in Bra, Italy, when I was teaching there. And they closed down the city center And all the bars were open and everyone was just loaded in the streets in the afternoon. All right. So let's see what a rice washed Negroni tastes like. What is it about bitter tastes that you're not so fond of? Hmm. Excellent question. Because there's a lot of a lot of the like you don't like gin and tonics, you don't no. like greater cocktails. There are lots of other bitter things that you're not so fond. Of. Well, actually, yeah. you like like bitter greens. Yes, it. Uh, but I got used to them because at first it's. I think it's not a taste that I'm drawn to immediately. Um, remember um, trying frise mm. and then uh, endives, and it took me quite a long time to get used to the taste yeah. and um if there's too much on the plate i find um it i get um kind of tired of it um yeah. very very quickly so your mouth sort of gets burnt on yes the, on the bitterness yeah hmm. all right well let's hope that this is the rice has soothed some of the bitterness in this uh strange now oh wow <laughs> dusty dusty pink negroni wow what a weird and interesting color yeah Well, the, in texture. the rice clouds it up, Yeah, obviously. Yeah. But it's also, it does, makes it less pretty. Mm -hmm. right. Well, cheers, big ears. Well, cheers. Oh, you're making a terrible face. <clears throat> yes. What do, you, what do you not like about it? 
it's has nothing to do with the rice. It's yeah. about that particular drink. I'm really not fond of a Negroni. Yes, and I brought Negronis to our first date. <laughs> I thought I was being so charming. And I brought Vespers. And you brought Vespers. <laughs> but you know what? I really like it with the rice yes. wash. No, no, no. I, I see what it brings to the drink. If only I had liked that drink better. Yeah. But do, um, you li- do you like this or rice wash Negroni better than a regular Negroni? Slightly. <laughs> but, but just not really. No, just not really. What's happening? I, no booze I am trying to, you know, widen my palette of different tastes that i like well that is but charming and 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 very open of you yes <laughs> stick this in your mouth <laughs> this drink that you don't like yes all right well i'm a i'm a convert to the rice washed negroni i think mm. it's a really i think there's a bit too much rice in this shaker but mm-hmm. but the effect is there and it is kind of pillowy or soft in the mouth no but i see what it brings in terms of texture the starch seems to thicken, just mm-hmm. uh, touch the all the liquids yeah. and bind the flavors together. Well, that, yeah, that's what it's supposed to do. That's mm-hmm. what I read today anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, I'm not a convert yet, but yeah. All right. So for tonight's drink, what do we do? Regular Vesper? Yay. Santé. Santé. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Talking about drinking alcohol in positive terms can be pretty fraught. It is part of our consumption landscape, and it does bring a lot of pleasure. At the same time, it is also at the root of a lot of suffering and trauma, very often generationally handed down. The production and sales of alcohol is also an enormous industry with ties to a lot of exploitation, slavery, and massive, massive profits. Liquor is just not a simple subject, and honest conversations about it often run into strong emotions and morality and defensiveness. Nonetheless, it's a fascinating part of our many different cultures, and it's worth getting closer to, as all things food and drink are. Having a better understanding of alcohol is one step towards a better relationship with it. In teaching about cocktails, I sometimes refer to a really remarkable article written by Malcolm Gladwell for The New Yorker. It was published in 2010, but I've included a link to it in the show notes. Gladwell writes about the very different ways that alcohol is consumed in various societies around the world, and the vast range of rituals and significances that drink has, culturally speaking. He also refers to an idea called myopia theory, a fascinating alternative interpretation of liquor's effects on human behavior, on the mind and the body. In short, he says that instead of lowering our inhibitions, drinking makes us focus on the thoughts and emotions that are closest to us. In his words, disinhibition suggests that the drinker is increasingly insensitive to his environment, that he is in the grip of an autonomous physiological process. Myopia theory, on the contrary, says that the drinker is, in some respects, increasingly sensitive to his environment. He is at the mercy of whatever is in front of him. That's why some drunks might be soft and silly, while others might turn angry and violent. All that baggage that we more easily ignore when we're sober is suddenly, apparently, too much in evidence when we're liquored up. It's worth reflecting on, in your own case, to see if it makes sense. I'll let you read the article for yourself. It's a great read, and maybe it will be useful in terms of learning how, when, and how much to drink, or not. So now we turn from cloudy cocktails to some pretty limpid responses to the food questionnaire. This week's voice is that of Ruth Wilkins, a research scientist for the government of Canada. Back in our youthhood, Ruth and I studied chemical physics together at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario, and we shared a house in my final year in undergrad where we ate an awful lot of craft dinner slathered with too many international condiments. Since then, Ruth and I took very different career paths, but we still do love us some Katie and hoisin sauce, or oyster sauce, or sriracha. <laughs> Ruth Wilkins has a master's degree in biophysics and a PhD in medical physics. She is chief of the Ionizing Radiation Health Sciences Division at Health Canada, overseeing biological research on the health effects of ionizing radiation. When we recorded her answers to the questionnaire, Ruth described herself as calm, kind, and curious. Ruth, what is your idea of a perfect food? 
My idea of a perfect food is something that is slow cooked, a comfort food that comes from local ingredients, and that it brings friends together. So something like a braised lamb shake, and there definitely has to be mashed potatoes, lots of mashed potatoes. Of what food or food context are you afraid or distrustful? I do not trust anything highly processed, especially if it has no clear indication of where it came from. I hate it when you see labeling that says prepared in Canada, but you actually don't know where the ingredients come from. So it makes me wonder what people are hiding. What food or concept describes a well-balanced food system? I would say farm to table. What word or concept describes why food systems often remain unbalanced? I would say the desire to have any food at any time of year. I always wonder why peaches from California are cheaper than peaches in Niagara in August when they're in season here. Which food innovation do you try to ignore? Any of the trending cooking equipment, things like Instapod and Air Fryer. I also ignore any vegan food that tries to look like meat. If you're going to eat vegan food, just eat vegan food. For what do you hunger? I hunger for affordable and healthy food for everyone. On what occasion do you feign satiety? Never. Uh, When I see food, I want to eat it. So I'm more likely to feign unsatiety if that is in fact even a word. What do you most dislike about dinner tables? I don't like when there is unnecessary clutter and tables that are too small to host all the people that I want to invite and have around the table. What is the quality you most like in a fruit? Juiciness. I like a fruit that has the ability to quench my thirst while bursting with flavor. What is the quality you most like in a cut of meat? I like a lean cut with a smattering of fat marbled through it. Which condiments do you most overuse? Is that even possible? I don't think so. What kinds of gardens make you happiest? I'm very happy in a vegetable garden that has been weeded and is overflowing with produce. Which culinary skill would you most like to have? I would love to have good knife skills, and hopefully someday we'll get some training in that. If you could change one thing about nutrition, what would it be? That big goods would be healthier. What do you consider your greatest edible achievement? I would say I was serving Thanksgiving dinner to 14 people in a small dining room where everyone went away full and happy. And I once made this awesome multi-layered hazelnut tort that was to die for. If you were to die and come back as an edible animal, vegetable, or mineral, what would you like it to be? Grapes, so I could be made into wine, travel the world, and rest in the bottle for years before being consumed. And then I would be sipped slowly and enjoyed. Where and or when would you most like to dine? That would be al fresco on a warm summer evening. What is your most treasured kitchen implement? I treasure my Lee Valley microplane. I use it for Parmesan, garlic, ginger, and anything else that needs to be finely grated. What is your favorite highly processed food? Probably Kraft Dinner. I never make it anymore, but I still would secretly love to eat it. Or maybe cheesies, the crunchy kind. Anything involving fake cheese flavoring is good. What is your favorite aroma? Roasting turkey. Walking into the house when someone is roasting a turkey, maybe it's me, but that's a great smell. What spice, kitchen implement, or cookbook do you use most rarely? I really try hard to get rid of implements that I don't use, but I do know I have some spices that I really rarely get used, like I have Chinese five spice in the back of my cupboard I haven't touched for years. What do you most value in your friend's food? I value fresh ideas, change from our usual, and that I didn't have to make it. Who are your favorite food celebrities? I have enjoyed watching Mary Berg and Spencer Watts on TV recently. What is your most powerful sense? Sense of direction. What are your favorite agricultural, culinary, or gastronomic words? Well, if I can use French for a minute, petoncle. Um, Also caramelized, especially when applied to onions. What would you eat as your second to last meal? I would eat seafood, uh, especially shellfish of all types. What food-related epitaph would you put on your own tombstone? Would have tried anything once, but should have skipped the salmon mousse. And that drains this glass full of making a meal of it, right down to the maraschino cherry and lemon zest. Thank you to Jean-Seb Michel, Alessandra Castelli, Ruth Wilkins, and my not-at-all-bitter booze buddy Maxime Giroux. To Lily Cleary as well for telling me about rice washing and Negroni. And to all the bartenders out there who interpret our needs, keep us safe, and raise our spirits. 
Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast so that others can get to know us. And if you have a favorite alcoholic or non-alcoholic cocktail recipe, please let me know. Next week, we're getting into gastronomy. Talking about what that rather lofty word can mean, evoke, and inspire, whether it's nation building, the production of pride, or promoting a city. A little history lesson provides some context for how the term has evolved from its roots in the early 1800s, and some etymological exploration suggests how it might be a great way to understand ecosystems. Join us, won't you? In the meantime, as so many drinkers have said before, Prost, Chin Chin, and Slancha! <laughs> <laughs>